Hey there folks, my name is Luke. Welcome to this episode of the Outdoor Gear Review. Today, this is an after the camp episode in regards to our latest overnight adventure, which I referred to as a second from disaster. Holy f Jesus Christ, guys, God blended right in. Didn't even see it until I almost stepped on it. Big old rattlesnake. Now folks, that is the trip where I headed down into the Pisgah National Forest where I almost stepped on a rattlesnake. I came this close to really having a serious problem. With this episode, I am going to talk about that trip, the gear, the things that you did see, that you didn't see, and so on. This is After the Camp. It starts now. Go ahead and grab yourself a cup of coffee, and let's get started. You guys will have to forgive me for recording inside of my office. Usually, I like to film outside, but it's a rainy day here in North Carolina. I figured, heck, why not? I will film this After the Camp episode to share with you all all the things that you saw and didn't see. Now, first off, we have to talk about that rattlesnake. That was a timber rattlesnake, and they are extremely dangerous, very venomous. They kill people all the time. It happens. I was so incredibly lucky that the snake was not aggressive. I came within one foot, 12 inches of that snake. And you could see it on camera. I was setting up for the shot. I had the camera something like this looking down. And I mean, that snake was right there. I was so far out in the middle of nowhere that if I would have gotten bitten by that snake, there's a good possibility that I could have died or I could have lost my leg. When a timber rattlesnake bites you, it begins breaking down the skin and the muscle, the venom does. So within one hour, you can have serious problems. Now, there are multiple aspects here to consider. First off, the anti-venom itself is extremely expensive. The last time that I heard of someone getting bit by a rattlesnake, it cost over $150,000 worth of anti-venom. It's extremely expensive. Getting bit by that rattlesnake would have been a life-altering experience. I, I really am thanking my lucky stars that I did not get bit. And the truth is, is that it would have been completely my fault. I posted a picture on Facebook of the snake and someone asked if I killed it. No, I did not. And there would be no reason for me to do so. That national forest is its home. And I was the person who you could say, in a sense, was trespassing. Having that snake in that park is completely different than having a rattlesnake in my yard. You know what I mean? So, no, I did not kill that snake. I would not kill that snake. If it was chasing me down out of self-defense, I would have. But if I'm the one who's stepping on it, it's my fault. You know, since I got back from that trip, I have thought about this rattlesnake and almost stepping on it just about nonstop. That really was a big mistake. It was my mistake. I was filming, I was tired, I was sweaty, and I just really wasn't paying attention. And that's my fault. Let that be a good lesson to you all. Anytime that you're heading out, backpacking, you're going camping, anything in the outdoors, and in life in general, you really have to pay attention because you are in charge. You are responsible for your own actions. You are responsible for the things that happen to you. You can never put your safety and your security in the hands of someone else. And that includes the police. That includes with snakes out in the forest or animals and so on. You have to be responsible for your own care. And this really does drive that point home. In my 30 plus years of being in the outdoors, I've made plenty of mistakes. This is the most recent one. I am sure that I will make plenty more. This was an eye opener and I needed that. You go a long time without having any sort of emergencies and issues and you do begin to let your guard down and it's important not to. Anytime that you are stepping outside of your door to head out for an adventure, there are plenty of risks, plenty of dangerous elements out there. So you have to be ready. You have to have your eyes open. You have to be ready to act. With this trip here, I was that close to really getting funked up. And I said, funk, not the other word, F-U-N-K, that's what I said. You know exactly what I mean by that. Phew, gosh, guys, <laughs> that close. When I got back from this trip, I showed my friends and my family this footage, and like the comments were all the same. Just like, Luke, you were that close. It was that close. 
incredible. Now, as you all saw, that was not the only snake that we saw in this adventure. We also saw a black snake, roughly five foot long. He was pretty cool. I am a big fan of black snakes because they are really, really good protectors. Not only do they take care of rodents and stuff like that, but they also kill any poisonous snakes. And when I say poisonous, I mean venomous, but I'm in the South, so it's poisonous snakes. Very rarely do you hear anyone say venomous. That snake was actually after something. He was chasing something through the woods there. You could see in the video where something, whatever it was that he was after, moved, and he was watching. Very cool. Now, when it comes to this adventure, this was a ton of fun. I had an absolute blast. I really did enjoy every single second of it. With my best estimating, we dropped roughly 2,000 feet in elevation. Of course, we went down the mountains, up, down, up, down to make it to the point where we were at, where we camped at. I tell you what, I was absolutely soaked in sweat. I brought roughly four liters of water with me and I drank every single bit of it. Unfortunately, where I camped at, there was no water nearby. So by that evening, I was almost out of water. I had enough water for coffee the next morning and then I had to replenish the next day. When it comes to exploration backpacking trips, that's one of the fun elements. You do not know where you're headed. You do not know where your supplies are going to be. So I headed off, followed this trail off into the woods. It was awesome. I had no idea where that trail went. It starts off as a road, turns into a trail, and then just goes off into the forest, as you all saw. In the wintertime, I would love to go back and maybe do a few day bushcraft camp out. There's so much material in that forest where you could build an awesome bushcraft shelter. Now, of course, you do have to worry about rattlesnake nests in the fall and the winter. In the future, we will talk about that sort of stuff. We won't waste any time now. Yes, that adventure took place on the Mountain to Sea Trail. That is divvied up into sections, and to be honest, I'm not familiar enough with the trail to tell you what section I was on. Anytime that you look up information about this trail, you will see that it's very poor. I believe there are a few books on the Mountain to Sea Trail, and maybe in the future I will have to get one. From what I understand though, the trail is not complete. A lot of it actually follows roads, and in my opinion, that's one of the worst aspects to it. You could be hiking on the Mountain to Sea Trail and you come out on the road and you have no idea where to go from there. Sometimes you have to follow the road for a couple miles, take another road, and then get back on the trail. And of course, there's no signage. I don't know. You really have to make sure that you research each section that you're going on for very good directions. That's how it goes. With my adventure, I started on one trail, got onto the Mountain to Sea Trail, and then left it from there. All in all, is a fairly easy trip as far as going downhill goes. You can see in the video where I'm just soaked in sweat. I have sweat pouring down my face. Even going downhill, it's not easy. Going downhill, you're fighting gravity, you're trying not to fall, just soaked in sweat. And of course, as we were going down the mountains, the temperature was going up. We went from 70 degrees on top of the mountains to roughly 85 degrees Fahrenheit down at the bottom. And it was hot, very hot. With this adventure here, we headed down into the Pisgah National Forest. When I say we, I'm talking about you, I'm talking about myself. In my opinion, we did this trip together. So we went into the Pisgah National Forest, which is made up of 500,000 acres. Isn't that something? 500,000 acres. And as you can see here from this aerial footage, we were in the middle of nowhere, 10, 20 miles away from anything or anyone. And that is why it would have been such a dangerous and serious situation if I had gotten bit by that rattlesnake. One thing that you all did not see in that adventure was that I received a phone call right before the sun went down. I got a call from my brother. Man, that is terrible news, buddy. I really hate to hear that. Well, I'll be back tomorrow. I'll give you a call. All right, man. He informed me that his wife's father was in the hospital and it was not looking good. Unfortunately, he actually passed away this morning. It's been a couple of days. Bill was a good guy. I always liked him. Um, rest in peace, my friend. Rest in peace. In regards to footage of things that you didn't see in that adventure, I replenished my water. I had a bottle with a filter on it, which I used to filter the water and drink it. Now folks, there is something that I did not show in the video, and it's actually something that I did not record, so I'll just have to tell you about it. In this episode, since I was in bear country, I had my bear bag. Well, that night I go to throw up my bear bag, I throw it up, and unfortunately, my line got tangled going over this limb. It basically went around the limb, 
and back over again somehow. I don't even know how that's possible, but that's what it did. My line is still hanging from that tree. <laughs> I was able to rig it up so that my bear bag was off of the ground and away from a tree, safe from the animals and so on, but the line and my carabiner are going to be staying in the forest forever, wrapped around a tree limb. There you have it. Even the pros make mistakes. And that was my trip of mistakes. And that's okay. That's how it goes. Almost stepped on a rattlesnake and I messed up my bear line, got stuck in a tree. That's life. That's life right there. In this world, nothing is perfect and no one is perfect. And that's the truth with me too. So let's talk about the gear which I used for this adventure, starting with the backpack. That was from Savada. I will flash the name on the screen for you all. That pack is awesome. There's only one thing that that pack needs to really take it to the next level. On the body of the pack, there are no side pockets and that backpack really, really needs side pockets. That way you can easily stow gear on the side of the pack. You have the compression straps, but you don't have any pockets for like hydration bottles, large knives or equipment that you want to attach there. Comfort wise, exceptional. Very, very comfortable. It handled the loadout very well. As far as load management and comfort goes, the pack was exceptional. It did a great job with my 30 pound loadout. No issues at all. Uh, when it comes to moisture management, uh, it's okay. You know, it's not the best out there. For a military grade product, not bad. Not bad at all. Of course, with a civilian pack, you can get better ventilation. But for a tactical pack, a military grade pack, not bad, not bad. Most importantly, the pack is comfortable and it offers you tons of space for all of your gear. It has the roll top, that really does work well. I did have a few pouches attached to the pack for easy access of like filming equipment, batteries, and so on. I also had a pouch on my hip belt and that is where I had my handgun. That is a Glock 43, nine millimeter. Great gun, not the smallest pistol in the entire world. I definitely have smaller but I happen to really like that one, and I'm a pretty good shot with it. Anytime that you're carrying a small handgun, a compact handgun, accuracy just about goes out the window, especially if you're in a situation where you're nervous, you know, where you actually need that gun, you probably won't be able to hit a barn unless you're well-trained with it. And with the Glock 43, I'm pretty well-trained with it. Because of the size, it is a little bit bigger than your average compact gun, you get better accuracy from it. So that is why I had that gun. Luckily, I did not need to use it. Before I went to bed that night on that trip, the coyotes were out in force. They were howling it up and I was surrounded. After that, I did not hear anything else from the coyotes that night. No experiences with bears, or any other type of animal. It was a good night, very calm, very peaceful. I did sleep very, very well. And part of that was due to the sleeping pad, which I had, that was the Nemo Zor sleeping pad. That thing is ultralight. Because the pad is a shorty and your legs are sticking off, you have more air around your legs. So you don't have your skin against that material. So it's a little bit more cooler, I guess you could say. So I stayed comfortable, slept great. And of course the tent was the Snug Pack Ionosphere which I absolutely love because it was dry that night and because I was under the canopy of the trees, there was no moisture. I had the fly pulled back. I, I just kicked back. I look at the stars. The air was coming in. I staked out one side real high to get better airflow. That really did work well. That is a great tent, easy setup, easy breakdown. Many of those in the military use that tent as well. I highly recommend it. It is one of my favorite tents and it is super budget friendly. You can buy it right now for $125. <laughs> That's not bad at all. That's not bad. Now, I had a question about the shoes that I was wearing for this trip. Those are from Vask, and that is the Mantra 2.0. I will be doing a review on these shoes fairly soon because I have been testing these out for a long time. You can pick these up for 120 bucks. They are a very lightweight shoe, trail shoe. I like them, but I don't love them. The sole is very, very hard. It's not the most uncomfortable shoe, but it's not the most comfortable either. When it comes to ticks, I had no issues. I did not see a single tick on that trip, and that's because I was well covered in repellent. I treated my clothing and my equipment prior to leaving on this adventure, and of course I used DEET on my skin. No issues with any bugs, really. That afternoon, there were some mosquitoes, but it wasn't bad. You can hear them buzzing in the camera, though, quite often. 
Jumping back to equipment, let's talk about the star of the show. The best piece of equipment that I used on that trip happened to be the Bush knife. Folks, I love that thing. It is a cross between a knife and a hatchet. It reminds me of a freaking lawnmower blade. It's just a big hunk of steel that you can use to chop through trees. You can use it to chop up limbs. You can process wood. You can even skin if you have to because it's so sharp. I love that knife, and the value of that thing is fantastic. It really is. If I remember correctly, the price of that knife is right around 70 bucks, and it is well worth the purchase. It is one of my favorite knives ever. You know, it's not very sexy, and it doesn't have to be. It's just a good hunk of steel that's very capable, and you can do anything with it. You can pick that up at wheresthelicker.com. It is well worth the money. I love that knife. It's awesome. It really is. I had a few questions about the drone. That is a Mavic Air from DJI. Fantastic drone, super small. That thing really does work well. And I plan on using that for more adventures, more trips, and even some gear reviews, namely flashlights. I have an interesting idea about that. You guys will see that in a future review. I almost forgot to talk about my favorite stove in the entire world. That is the Swiss M71 stove. That is an alcohol gel stove. It's so simple, but guys, it works so incredibly well. I absolutely love it. Right next to the knife, this was my favorite piece of kit for this trip. I highly recommend that you get your hands on an M71 stove. You could buy a pack of three, pack of six, buy one, refill it, with Sterno. They work so incredibly well. Highly recommended. Highly recommended. Now, as I stated in that adventure, I had to make it back home early that morning so I could take my daughter to her Navy appointment. Guys, I made it home with like 20 minutes to spare. I got home, hopped in the shower, and hit the road. I had to drive two hours for this meeting. Luckily, it was a good meeting and all that good stuff. Because my daughter has joined the Navy and she's waiting to ship out in September, she has to do her depth meetings and stuff like that. So twice a month, we have to drive over two hours for these meetings. It is well worth it. It takes a ton of work, a ton of time, but gosh, I am so excited for Madison. She's shipping out very, very soon, less than six weeks now. Wow. Wow. How about that? As far as an after the camp episode, this pretty much wraps it up. We have discussed every aspect of this trip, including the trip itself. Things that you did not see. We talked about the location. We talked about the gear. We even talked about the mistakes that I made for this trip. So guys, thank you very much for joining me for this adventure. Thank you all so much for supporting the Outdoor Gear Review. As I mentioned before, the channel is 100% agenda free. No store. I'm not trying to sell you guys anything. I don't care if you buy any of the products which I show off. I don't offer coupon codes to the viewers. I don't offer any discounts or anything like that. I'm not trying to sell anything. If the product is good, you want to buy it? Great. I hope you enjoy it. This channel is fully supported by you all, by the viewers, by Patreon. So guys, thank you so much for your support. It really does mean a lot. If you all have any questions for me, email me and I will address those for you. Strength and honor. I will see you all around. Bye guys.